I share with you now from the Gospel of Mark, our scripture reading for this morning. I will be reading from the 10th chapter, starting with the 46th verse. Listen now to these words. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is true that God creates, knows, loves, and sees all of us in our full humanity. But as people, we can fall into the habit of assuming everyone is the same or everyone is like us. While we share a common humanity, assumptions that we are simply the same can be harmful and prevent us from truly seeing other people and listening to their perspectives. By looking at biblical stories this series will help us learn how to listen, respect, affirm, celebrate, and truly live in community with others. In doing so, we can also come to know God even more fully. So as we begin, I want to invite you to watch and do your best, no judgment here, do your best with this video. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it, but did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Who's willing to admit they didn't see the gorilla? 
All right, and who didn't see the player leave the game? I didn't get that one either. Who, who didn't see the curtain change? Yeah. <laughs> this, this rather famous study is a fun way to reveal that we have pretty selective attention. We might think we're great at multitasking and great at focusing on all things, but as that can reveal, gorillas get by us all the time. This might make a, uh, a great video, but does something like this actually happen in real life? Does this kind of hyper-focus actually cause us to miss really obvious things? I can speak from experience that it absolutely does. In my first years as a pastor, I served at two small churches in the Cleveland area. And I was still in seminary at the time, and so I was, as we like to call, a quarter-time pastor. There's like this sort of mysterious thing where a pastor actually only works like 15 hours a week. Doesn't happen. But that's what I was supposed to do. And the church has kind of had this, this accepted understanding that I basically made a bulletin, I preached, and then like every once in a while I'd show up to an event at the church, and that was basically good enough. I had to focus on seminary. But because I was only at a certain number of events, the events that I did go to, or the events that I did put on, I made them really, really, really elaborate. And so I'd put hours and hours and hours and hours into designing them. I'd pour way too much time into my bulletin, pretending like anyone cares what the title of my sermon is. Does anyone care about sermon titles? No, <laughs> right? I put so much time into my messages, thinking that the most, most important thing I ever had to do on a Sunday morning was preach a bomber and then I'm good. But I discovered that's not really the case. So it was my second Holy Week. Holy Week sucks, and especially Holy Week sucks if you're a quarter-time pastor. That's just, no, not fun. And I put together this really elaborate Monday Thursday service, and I invited both congregations to come together for it, which is awesome. We don't really get to see each other, so it's fun. And then um, I cooked the whole meal myself. I made like 12,000 a year. I don't know what I was thinking. I set up some nice candles. It was really great. And after the service was over, uh, you know, people come up and they did the, the obligatory, great service, pastor, you know. And then I would hit him back with a, thank you so much for coming, or it's so great to see you, right? <laughs> and then this woman, parishioner, amazing, courage, oh my gosh, courage, looks to me and says, and she's from, uh, she's from Nigeria, I think, something like that. She goes, what is my name, pastor? And I stared at this woman for what felt like an eternity. And I realized that in the 15 or so months that I had been pastoring these two small churches, and this person who had came to church every single week, I did not know her name. And I simply said, ma'am, I'm sorry. I just don't know. And she left the church and did not return again. So in my passion, in my desperation to focus so hyper on doing what I thought was the most in part of ministry, I realized that I was not being the most spectacular minister. The intense focus of my work in the church caused the congregation to be my invisible gorilla. Throughout this series, we're going to be building layer upon layer of what it takes to see somebody fully for who they are, and the selfless and intentional efforts that we must go through to look past ourselves and our assumptions about whether or not we're doing a great job. The first week is easy, as it just invites us to be more aware of those that are around us. Consider those times when you felt like you weren't being noticed or appreciated by your superiors, when your suggestions just didn't really seem like they were being considered truthfully. You know, someone's like, oh, that's a great idea. We'll come back to that. We'll circle back to that in a little while, you know? Think about those, all those times that a spouse, a child, or a friend has given you that look that something's wrong, but you didn't realize it because you were trying to be the best spouse, friend, or parent that you thought you could be. And the invisible gorilla walked right on by. If you're in a high-up position in your company, when's the last time you did a review of your team? Praise them by name and ask them about their personal lives. My hope is, as we walk through this gospel together and see Jesus' interaction with Bartimaeus in the gospel of Mark, that we can be enriched by the Spirit to see as God sees each of us, to love as Jesus loves each of us. And as we turn to examine the scripture, let us take just a moment to pray. 
Spirit of the living God, come now and grow our faith. Come and deepen our hope. Come and strengthen our love. And come and water within each of us here the desire to be your faithful family forever. Let the church say, Amen. So turning our attention to our gospel reading this morning, we have Jesus and his merry band of followers, and they just seem to enter Jericho and then immediately leave it. And on their way out of the city, a blind man is calling out to Jesus. He's asking him for healing, saying, have mercy on me. The disciples in the crowd, they try to hush the man. They sternly tell him to be quiet, as it says in scripture. You get it, Jesus is a big deal. You can't just walk into the CEO's office and expect a meeting. You gotta schedule this kind of stuff, you know? Call us up, we'll get you on the books. Jesus will come talk to you, be quiet, right? And then Jesus stops walking after a little bit, after the man continues to call out, and he asks him, what can I do for you? He tells the man to come to him. The guy takes off his cloak, apparently, rushes up to Jesus. Meanwhile, he's blind, keep that in mind. Rushes up to Jesus, and Jesus heals him of his blindness, saying that his faith made him well. The crowd tri- So there are three things that I want to, to have you take away from this message. Surprise, surprise, three, it's my magic number. The first is, the crowd tries to shush the man. The second is when Jesus makes the man come to him, which I think is interesting. And then the third one is Jesus' very question to that man. These are the three things. Let's start with one. We got communion, so this is going to be a quick one. That's a lie, but we're going to get through it. (laughs) The crowd tries to shush the man as he calls out. It has some pretty potent information to it. It has a different way of looking at the disciples, does it not? Before we get to that, I want us to be fair to the disciples. Fair and address their likely assumptions that they had about this man first. Assumptions that I wouldn't be surprised if you and I had as well. This man probably didn't look particularly intelligent. He probably smelled funny. He probably looked dirty. He clearly was ceremonially unclean in the Jewish faith because he was outside the city walls of Jericho. And the only thing he had to him was a cloak. So I guess what we could say, and by the way, an extra challenge is he was blind. So this was going to be a whole scenario, you know? In a comparative situation, I guess we could say the man looked homeless. And not just homeless, but kind of like the belligerent looking ones. I wonder if the man looked cleaner, if he fit the part of his intelligence better, if maybe he would have been taken more seriously. You know, there's this homeless gentleman that has come to the church uh, for aid a few times in the past couple of years. Reverend Joyce has gotten to know him pretty well over the years. And this man, homeless, has a master's degree from like John Carroll in like economics or business administration or some really hard degree to get. But when I first hear homeless, I don't think masters of business administration or economics. My assumption is that alcohol, drugs, mental illness, or trauma is the reason that man's on the street. But much like the man that Joyce has helped, there is a profound intelligence to Bartimaeus. You see, he doesn't heckle Jesus, at least he doesn't say he does. He doesn't even call him like a generic like rabbi or something. He doesn't even just call him Jesus. He gives Jesus a proper title saying, Jesus, son of David, illustrating that he understands where the, where the Messiah is to come from. He understands the royal line. He understands who Jesus is in accordance to the faith. This is an intelligent man. And I wonder if the disciples just couldn't see that because their initial instinct was to think he wasn't. Last time I preached, I shared some information from a book that I recently finished called Blink. And like you all, so good, I know every single one of you read it, right? If you didn't, here's a reminder, go read Blink. It's a book about our instincts and both the good that we can do with those initial instincts and the biases that they can reveal. It's written by Malcolm Gladwell in 2013, I think. Seeing as Blink is all about our immediate impressions upon people we see, I think it's applicable to share a little bit more from the book. When it comes to race, we have a number of innate bias connections that can be revealed through testing. This is a really weird part of the book in a <coughs> profound way. For example, when alternating pictures of both white men and black men appeared alongside alternating pictures of a wallet and a gun, 
Every single one of the participants associated the black man with the gun and the white man with the wallet. But there was no priming. Just for some reason, that happened. This study was inspired by the infamous shooting of Amado Diallo, who was shot outside his house 41 times as he was reaching for his wallet. All of this started because people saw a lone black man standing outside his house after midnight, assumed that he was sketchy and it led to a police call. Our assumptions about what makes someone sketchy led to a man's death. In another study from NPR, it's revealed that races with obviously non-white names are much less likely to be considered for an interview. And so cultures are being forced to give up their culture and name their child a more colonial name in hopes that they have a higher chance of success in appeasing their white bosses. And even if they are hired, data reveals that people that are non-white are more likely to be put into situations in which they're not seen. For example, a dishwasher or a line cook, as opposed to a server. We might see a Latinx name or a black name and assume that they are non-intelligent or unqualified for the job, even if we aren't overtly thinking that. When it comes to communities, the term white flight exists for a reason. It applies to any time a minority group that's non-white comes into a, a, an area where all white people live. Once the majority starts to lean on the other side, everyone takes off to go find a new place to live, taking the economy of the area with it, too. And whether it's silent protests or riots in the streets, the black community has been shushed down like Bartimaeus by the media and by their non-white counterparts far too often with the assumption that they just have it wrong. Biases prevent us, like the crowd that looked at Bartimaeus that day, from seeing the person beyond our own assumptions, from seeing the intelligence, the potential, and the pain in all of people created in God's image. But the man doesn't give up. He's persistent. He keeps crying out and crying out, and finally Jesus recognizes him. And he does not directly invite the man over. I find this so interesting. And he makes some of his disciples do it. And I love that. Because just a moment ago, the disciples were really uncomfortable by this guy, weren't they? Saying, no, go away, quiet, call us up, get an appointment. And then Jesus says, no, you'll be the one to invite him over now. I love back when we were able to, when I got to take groups to Trials for Hope, the, the group that helps to serve the homeless of downtown Cleveland. I love this because on the way there, I'd often be fielding questions about, like, safety and what to do and you know what if in this situation all that kind of stuff and I don't say that to shame people that have asked me those questions because those are the very same questions that I asked Jonathan trials as CEO the first time I went out with him and by the third or fourth person that we visit you can kind of see this noticeable shift in the group we go from sort of initially that, that little trepidatious handing of the care package like okay be well and they kind of step back to the car to then the visits taking longer and longer and longer because people start to laugh together. They share stories together. They listen deeply. They hug the people we're providing for. Because the beautiful thing is when we can truly see somebody and our assumptions dwindle, we can realize that the circle has room for all of us still and that all of us are inherent of worth and being. But the calling of Bartimaeus also reveals something else about faith, too. It reveals that a journey with Christ and being healed of our biases is not a convenient or a comfortable thing. I think that this is especially a concern for churches as the pandemic starts to wane off and the ability to come back becomes a thing again. Because virtual options have become so much easier, right? So much easier to understand. We can tune in from our spaces of convenience, and we can sure as heck tune out as soon as it gets uncomfortable, right? Trust me, I love this iPad because I can see how many people are watching at a time. And I can get a good old giggle. And any time I get up in the pulpit and start to talk about something in the news, you can just immediately see that number plunge, right? I can look out and cross the faces of people here, and I can see your souls just leave your bodies. You'd be like, I'll be back in a little bit. He's talking about some uncomfortable stuff, right? There he goes again, that pastor. 
But the beautiful thing is, friends, Jesus could have gone to that man. He did it for the man whose daughter was dying. He went with Ananias to his house. But in this situation, he didn't. He told the man to come to him. He told the man, it's not going to be convenient to be healed. It's not going to be comfortable. You're going to have to get rid of that cloak, that one thing that, that can protect you from the sun, the one thing that gives you comfort at night. You've got to get rid of it if you want to be healed. You've got to get uncomfortable. You've got to embrace the inconvenience if you want to be healed of your bias. To be a follower of Jesus Christ, it is not easy. It's not Sunday fun day happy time. In fact, many times, it's pretty stressful. But the next time you feel yourself being urged to go just a little deeper into discomfort, just a little deeper into the inconvenience, don't frame it as a negative. Don't shut down. Ask yourself, is this Jesus calling me to be healed? And I hope with the urgency of Bartimaeus that you will get up and you will go, even if you can't quite see that well. And in my short time here, I've noticed a number of you do just that, and it's been the most beautiful thing to watch. Third and final thing. When the man approaches Jesus, Jesus asks the man, what do you want from me? I find this interaction wonderful, because I think Jesus probably could have assumed what the man wanted. I mean, one, he's Jesus, he knows everything. But also, the man probably didn't get up very gracefully. Again, he's blind. He had a stumble to Jesus, again, blind, and when he gets up to Jesus, you could see the fogginess of his eyes. Jesus probably knew what the man wanted. He had heard about the other man that Jesus, you know, spit in his eyes and made him see again, right? And despite Jesus knowing what he wanted, he didn't assume that. He gave the man the opportunity to voice his needs for himself. We have the chance to be like Jesus. Whenever we look at our non-white sisters and brothers and we ask, what do you want from me? Whenever we ask a non-straight person to just explain it to us. Whenever we take our eyes off our own task to check in on our team, our family, and our friends, we become like Jesus saying to them, I see you. I hear you. I affirm you. Your voice matters to me. Your lived experience matters to me. Your culture matters to me. You are loved, and I am here to learn. I see you. As we begin to transition to communion time, I want to share one final story with you. Many months after that most awkward Monday Thursday service, where I admitted to the woman I did not know her name, it was yet again another communion Sunday, much like today. And I was probably going over my time, much like today. And that church had a tradition that took up so much time. They would all come to the front of the church and they'd form this giant big circle, right? And the idea being we are all one body in Christ, right? And then the pastor would walk around the circle and sidestep each person and be like, you know, I'd give the elements to them. The bread of love, the cup of peace, the bread of love, the cup of peace, the bread of love, the cup of peace, whatever, right? And then as I'm shimmying to the side one more time, I look up and I'm ripping off the piece of bread to see. And who do I make eye contact with? But that woman whose name I did not know her name. And I quickly shoved that bread back into its little pocket and I grabbed her hands in mine and I looked her deep in the eyes and I said, it is so good to see you, Lorene. And this little smile she gave me at first became a much bigger one. And then we just had a little giggle together in that circle as we remembered our last very awkward meeting. And she said, Pastor, it's so good to be seen. I share this story with you for two reasons. One, I'm a big dum-dum. <laughs> it's just fun to make fun of me. No, but really. It is never too late to see somebody, truly for who they are. And it's never too late to be seen to those that, in whom you want to be open with. And secondly, because Jesus Christ at his table sees each of us fully for who we are. And when he invites us to ask that, answer that question of what do you want from me, that's being extended to you today as well. And I hope that as you come to receive these elements, that you can feel the grace and the love of God surround you and know that Jesus can help heal you 
and help you to see just as he sees.